everyone, how's it going? I hope everyone is staying cool and being properly hydrated and, and getting into some air conditioned conditions today. It is hot, it is swampy. Uh, today is June 13th. I am here at the Sosuko Urban Egg Demonstration Farm in Southern Cook County. It has been a while since I've uh, released a vlog and that's on me, that's on me. I need to be more consistent with this as I've talked about in the past. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Uh, it's just been a really challenging year for those of you who farm and garden uh, in urban settings or rural settings. You know, this has been quite a challenging year for all of us. Right now, we're coming off of a seven day stretch with really abnormally, well, relatively abnormally low temperatures. So we've experienced some true spring like conditions uh, here in the first part of June over the past seven days. But right now we are in the middle of a heat advisory that's starting right now, a few hours ago, all the way through Wednesday. Uh, at 8 p.m. and we are likely going to see some record-breaking temperatures so going from an unseasonably cold early spring some record low average temperatures to a crazy <laughs> uh, super hot month of May kind of back to normal and now we're going to be experiencing record setting temperatures possibly seven 90 degree uh, days in June which just that just doesn't happen uh, so uh, this is might be what we're in for, for from here on out in terms of looking at the ever-changing climate and dealing with these changing conditions. So we'll adapt and we will uh, trudge forward. So I wanted to bring you some updates, just maybe some brief updates, hopefully, uh, from the Urban Ag Demonstration Farm. Things are really, we're finally catching up. Uh, we had a really strong programming uh, finished MEFTP up and now we're really just focused on the demonstration farm and the donation project our soil media testing project that some of you may be involved with and uh, just really getting some research projects going here at the urban farm and just kind of catching up to speed we're going to be having some extra help starting in a couple of weeks and so things are looking up and I'll just just We'll just walk around, just take a couple, a peek at a couple things. Since we're going to be experiencing some abnormally high temperatures over the next few days, I want to show you what I do to deal with that in terms of uh, microclimate creation, sort of season extension, if you will, for the hot parts of the year. We're going to look at some shade cloth possibilities. I'm going to show you that. And we'll just do just a quick little walk around to see what's going on. So uh, once again, Really appreciate you watching our Urban Ed Connect vlog videos. We're going to try to bring this to you more. Need to get my Instagram channel going. Get some of you subscribed to that and really start putting these videos out. A little bit, these vlogs out a little bit more frequently than I have been. So, uh, yeah, so we hope to see you uh, soon and hope to see you at the site soon. Maybe we'll be having some field days, demonstration days here at the Urban Farm this summer. So, Hope the season's going well, and please stay cool out there during these next few days. It really is going to be warm, record high temperatures, record high heat indexes, upwards of almost 110 degrees, which is just unheard of. You can see I'm, you'll have to excuse me, I am just completely swampy and balmy right now with around my neck everywhere, so I'm looking to, to get out of here in a little bit and go do some office work uh, in air conditioning. So hopefully you are all doing the same. So take care out there and we'll talk to everyone soon and we're gonna check out some updates. So here we are inside of the tunnel at the Sosucro Extension Urban Ag Research Farm. And as you can see, our tomatoes are well underway. Maybe the last time we chatted, we were looking at some of these you know, late winter plantings. We've got some kales that we've been harvesting from and donating some lettuces. But right now we're in full transition to our warm season crops, our tomatoes being the, the vast majority of what we're doing in here. Rather than our CBD trial this year, we're actually just gonna take up our grow bags along the aisle and we're you know, growing other warm season fruiting crops like peppers and, and cucumbers that we're gonna trellis vertically. Got a little bit of peppers up front here. So yeah, our, our kale and spring crops are really coming on outdoors. So. We'll continue harvesting the, the kales in here for a while, uh, but our tomatoes are really off and running. In fact, you can really start to see in our early girl, uh, new girl variety trial, you can see some uh, fruiting clusters that are really just a few weeks off. So this is pretty typical. I'm seeing some cherries already starting to ripen. Today's June 13th, so that typically happens. We got these plants in here around April 28th, I want to say somewhere in there a little bit later than usual the plan always is to try to get them in here the second week of april 
but I'm always monitoring the long-term 10-day weather forecast as well as other um, weather data from NOAA. And this year, it was a combination of logistics and a little bit of the weather. So it took us a little while to get in there. You can see some actually really large uh, fruiting clusters right there on this variety. Let's see what this one is. This is this is Gin Fizz. So we're trialing Gin Fizz again. It's another kind of Mr. Stripey bicolor uh, high tunnel tomato. In the middle here, we're doing a uh, really fun irrigation post-harvest bricks sugar content variety trial with two early tomatoes. One is early girl, one is new girl. They're both 60 day hybrid tomatoes, typically the earliest kind of slice of tomato you can get. They're smaller, four to six ounce red globes. And what we're doing with the trial here is we're, we're gonna really be putting them on a irrigation regimen. So I'm getting ready to start install some tensiometers, which are soil moisture monitoring devices. We'll show those in another vlog. And I've, you see I have some different color flags here. We have a few different replicates. And what we're going to try to do here is really regulate uh, irrigation on one of the replicates. So we're replicating the varieties, and then we're going to replicate the irrigation regimen. So one regiment will be irrigation schedule like we normally do, just, you know, one inch, one and a half inch per week. What does that schedule look like? leave the drip on based on the timing system. The other one is we're going to close and we'll, we'll, what I learned last year is that you really need a tensiometer to kind of help manage that irrigation schedule. But the other thing we're going to do is we're going to try to replicate uh, California dry farming here in the tunnel. So what that essentially means is we'll continue to apply drip irrigation up until these fruiting clusters are really just about ready to go in terms of ripening. And then for the dry farm treatment, we're gonna very closely regulate water. In fact, we may even have the water off for a long period of time and push it to the limits with the tensiometer. So the tensiometer will tell us when we're very close to the permanent wilting point and we're gonna ride it right up to that edge for that treatment. And the idea is, is that the same thing with a lot of fruiting crops with drip irrigation is that if you over irrigate your fruiting clusters, your, your fruiting, your fruit on your crops, that you can dilute the sugar content in the fruit themselves. And I've tried this, I've tried dry farmed uh, early girl tomatoes in California and they really are sweet. Uh, in fact, they're, they probably, my hypothesis is that they have a higher bricks content than even like for instance, uh, this is sun gold. You can see some of these starting to ripen already which has a bricks content of, I think around six to seven or seven to 10, which is pretty high. Probably the sweetest cherry you're gonna get. Trying to replicate that sweetness with these early tomatoes, these early kind of globe, small six ounce tomatoes. So this is a cluster, you know, these are probably two to three ounces here. I mean, this is more typical of what an early new girl would look like in terms of a four or five, six ounce. Slicer. So I'm excited about this. It's one of the first kind of true replicated experiments we're doing here. We're going to see if we can kind of control sweetness uh, with that particular variety in the high tunnel, kind of replicating dry farming. Won't really know the economics of it at this point, but we're just going to be trying it out. And then we're doing just our standard variety trial, looking at several varieties. Some are the same from last year. Some are going to be slightly different. We're also working with Dr. Casey Ethy on campus on a uh, beneficial pest monitoring program. So we have a bunch of yellow sticky cards in here and we are monitoring aphid predation. Once again, we always have aphid pressure in here. Not really that bad on the tomatoes as usual, but on our peppers, they seem to be stunting growth. So this is something, even though I talk about all the time, avoidance, cultural avoidance in terms of you know, planting or tolerance, I should say, not the, the cultural practice of, of plant tolerance. Here you can see some cucumbers. So getting some uh, fruit, This is these are some smaller greenhouse cucumbers. We're already starting to harvest a few of these. I need to get the trellis up. But you can see here on the peppers, some pretty decent aphid pressure in there. I am seeing some uh, parasitoid activity in terms of mummification, either it's a Phytolides or a Phidias, I'm not sure 
which one it is, which parasite it is. But I haven't released any beneficials in here. Here you can see some mummies. If I can focus in there. I actually have a video of a parasitoid in action. Maybe I can cut that into this vlog to show you some of that. But the aphid, here are some of the earliest peppers I planted in here. And they're starting to come on a little bit, but you can see this yellow sticky card up here is just filled with uh, aphid adults. And these leaves have just had lots of pressure, aphid pressure. So decent balance. I mean, I'm starting to see actually probably more of the parasitoid mummies than aphids. So maybe the balance is starting to come back. I have applied, you know, some proactive reactive controls like using horticultural soap and a little bit of hygienic, as minimal as possible. So yeah, that's kind of what's going on up here. I don't want to spend too much time in here. Got some really cool new trellising stuff with this clipper system. We'll come back with that maybe a little bit in a different vlog. I just wanted to cut to some activity going on here in the high tunnel. And we'll transition to talk about what you see up here with our shade cloth. I'm going to talk about that. So I'm going to cut here. We'll go outside and look at the shade cloth action. So here we are outside. And here's the shade cloth. The sun just came out. The heat advisory is in effect. It's going to be really hot. So whenever we reach these days, which we've already done this once in May, because we had some abnormally seasonally high temperatures in the low 90s in May. So I had the shade cloth on for about a week already in May. And now with this next four days of heat advisory, I'm going to put the shade cloth back on. It really works. This is, I, I believe this is this is a 30% shade cloth at a minimum, but maybe it's a 50% shade cloth, you know, depending on the size of the weave itself right here. That's how it determines the opacity or the percentage shade that you're getting. And it really does lower the temperature. I don't have the data logger information on the top of my head, but it it brings it down to at least what the ambient air temperature is outside, if not a little bit lower. So we're going to test that out over the next few days. It's supposed to be 98, 99 degrees. So if I can keep the tunnel in that mid 90s to upper 90s during that stretch without it getting into the 110, 115, 120, that's going to be a success uh, because on a sunny day with those upper 90s temperatures, that is, that's a lot of heat in there that the ventilation is going to help. Both the roll-up sides are up and the active ventilation is going to help, but the shade cloth will kind of push it over the edge. So shade cloth for tunnels, greenhouse, it's not the only spot you can use it. You can also use it out in the field. So here we have a fertility trial we're replicating this year with lettuce and different fertility treatments. And I have the first replication in, that's what all the flags are. And I have these, this is actually one little spot that I don't have enough shade cloth for, so it's gonna throw a little bit of error into my data. But the other spots, I do have shade cloth on. And here I have some burnt up crispy <laughs> uh, cucumbers. And I'm probably gonna need to replant, but some of them are gonna survive under insect protect netting. And I just decided to throw a bit of shade cloth over the top of that. So I wanna have you know, these are all 40 foot beds. These are about 35 foot shade cloth pieces. So I want to be able to use my low tunnel hoop infrastructure, not only for insect netting, for exclusion practices, for insect control, but also for microclimate creation. So I could use it for floating row cover fabric for frost protection, but I could also use it for sh uh, shade cloth and creating that microclimate. So I just have it covering just the eggplants established, I won't cover the tomatoes and outdoor peppers that are establishing right now. Um, but these are all on drip irrigation, should be good to go. But I will use these for other, for the next replication of lettuce or other beds of lettuce that we're trying to establish in the summer. The One of the critical pieces to that is the overhead irrigation, bolt resistant or heat tolerant head lettuce varieties, but then also using shade cloth. Now, maybe not using it the whole time, but definitely at least to getting it established so, you know, that heat isn't really preventing those transplants from too much shock and will and allowing them to get established so you can actually do successions of lettuce during the summer months. Got some Boltine, Brasca greens. Our kales are obviously all established, all of our cooking greens outdoors. So we'll, we'll flip those beds. 
And yeah, we just, we still just have successions of the cucurbits to go in, more turnips, beets, all the quick uh, turnaround crops like radishes. We've cut down on a variety this year. We're going to focus, you know, a lot obviously on the, the fruiting crops, both outside and in the tunnel as well as some of the core staples that the, the pantry likes that we work the pantries that we work with like hopefully doing turnips salad turnips a lot of leafy greens We've got our scallions our some of our first broccoli planting so stuff is is coming on a little bit late because of the season but things things are happening so you can see some of the pepper successions in here and the raised beds got the irrigation raised bed set up here what we're doing is you can see we have the peppers on the right side and we're going to be doing occupying the south sides of the beds with you know quick growing crops like um like radishes that you can see just coming up there so we're trying to interplant and maximize the use of our, our space out here here's a little bit of volunteer cilantro that actually grew up last year we've harvest, harvested this twice and now it's finally rebolting so People ask me about volunteer and a carryover crops all the time. And from a commercial production planning standpoint, it doesn't really fit well. But sometimes you can have little accidents where, you know, I left some uh, kind of coriander at that point seeds to mature in this bed. And I, even if we pulled it out, which I can't remember if we did or not, the seeds dispersed, found their way in the beds, they overwintered and then germinated. So that was kind of a nice surprise. And you know, if you're a home gardener, home grower, you can do stuff like this and and definitely harvest your, your volunteer stuff. So just a quick few updates, a lot happening, and we will definitely return to talk more and, and do more vlogs as the season progresses. So hope you're all staying cool and hydrated, and we will talk to you all next time. Mm -hmm.